questions, please type them in the questions area and click send to submit them. The presenters will answer your questions during the Q&A portion. At this time, I would like to introduce Heather Meeker, shareholder at Greenberg Traurig and chair of our Intellectual Property and Information Technology Licensing and Transactions Group. Heather regularly advises software and technology companies on how to comply with the requirements of open source licenses and how to structure open source business transactions and models. She is the author of The Open Source Alternative, a handbook for business people, engineers, and lawyers about practical strategies for dealing with open source licensing. And without further ado, here is Heather. Thank you, Ileana, and welcome to everyone. We uh, have a group of about 20 people in the room here, and uh, we also have many people on the web webinar. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, uh, please, if you're in the room, feel free to raise your hand. If you're on the webinar, there is a way that you can ask questions on the webinar, and we will try to monitor that as well. Um, I, I would like to uh, introduce to you now um, my co-presenter, Michael Herzog. Am I saying that right, Michael? I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that the little German that I know is serving me. Um, he's the CEO of Nextbee. Um, Nextbee is a company that uh, I would describe as one of the new generation of software uh, provenance companies. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, um, companies that do um, uh, scanning and assessment of code bases to create bill of materials and meta information about the code base in order to do compliance. Um, Michael and his uh, Nextbee co-founder, Philippe, uh, were the architects of the standard format for exchanging software package data now known as SPDX, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the presentation, at least Michael will, because I would not pretend to talk about it much. Um, it's a very exciting project. Um, Michael has over 25 years of experience in the software industry. He currently worked at, for instance, KPMG and Oracle. He is a graduate of Harvard. I will forgive him for that because uh, I'm a Yale And um, has a BA in German language and literature, proving that you, um, you know, actually I've known a really lot of technology people who studied German. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm going to talk for the first part of the presentation, and I'll turn it over to Michael. The presentation today is going to be about open source compliance. OK, I don't know why that's not working. <laughs> Lower left corner, the, <laughs> the arrows. Right, I'm lower left. Oh, I yeah, lower left, yeah, lower left. Arrow. Um, well, I'll talk for a moment and maybe you can figure yeah, out how to okay. do this. Uh, so we're, we're going to be talking about open source compliance. And some of you have heard me talk about this topic before. Some of you have probably heard me talk about this more than you ever thought you wanted to in your life. Uh, but this is going to be a little bit different because we're going to go into some of the more specific uh, ways that you do compliance, some of the practical strategies for compliance. I'm going to talk briefly about what the requirements are, and then Michael is going to get into some of the details about how you deal with this day to day. And uh, you know, my clients uh, are often you know very interested in this question and and really uh, struggling with trying to do this in a practical way. So. Uh, we put the presentation together today with a view towards giving you stuff you can really work with. So I hope that's what it will be. Uh, so just a brief roadmap to start. Uh, we're going to identify some of the most common open source license obligations. So what do open source licenses require you to do? We're going to explain what you need to do to comply with these obligations. Uh, and then we're going to discuss some of the the, the real challenges that people have dealing with this day-to-day -day and outline uh, 
approaches for automating compliance. Anybody who has worked in this area understands that unless you can use automation in this process, you, you will have more work than you can possibly ever do. Um, and then Michael is going to describe in some detail some automation case studies and we will take your questions, but as I said, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Yes, thanks. Um, can we go forward? Oh. Ah, thanks, okay. So, is this <coughs> the first one? Um, I think we're, we... Oh, that, that's the first one, okay. So, the requirements of open source licenses, first I should say that Open source licenses are conditional copyright licenses. So while I may use the word obligation, I don't want to mislead anyone into thinking that is like a contractual covenant because it is not. It is a condition to exercising the license. So when we say obligations or requirements, technically what we're saying is conditions to exercise the license. So the open source license says you can use this software, you can do anything you want with it, here are the conditions for doing that. And it is the conditions that create these compliance um, needs that we're going to be talking about today. So we've listed the most common ones, and really um, the first four or five of them are, um, maybe six, are the ones that you're going to spend most of your time dealing with. But we're going to go through the categories of of uh, requirements. Now, each open source license may differ slightly about these requirements, but this, these are the general categories that you're going to deal with. The first is copyright and license notices. All open source licenses have notice requirements. So uh, particularly if you distribute the software, uh, you are going to have to place a copyright and licensing notice on what you distribute. And people actually spend a great deal of time on that requirement, and we'll talk about it in some detail. Um, attribution requirement, in the lingo of open source world, this is slightly different from a copyright or a license notice, and not many open source licenses contain these, uh, but they are, they are additional kinds of notices that you have to do. For instance, there are some licenses that say, if you mention the features of this uh, software in your documentation, you must also say this software was originally provided by this person. So it goes beyond just a plain licensing or copyright notice that would go in the source code for the software or it, uh, on, a, on a, a, a notice file that, that would be delivered with binary. Um, copyleft obligations, of course, this is the reason why we spend most of the time we do on open source compliance, and I will just explain briefly what copyleft is. Copyleft is uh, the, the uh, paradigm that is embodied by, say, the general public license or the GPL. And it essentially says, if you distribute this software, then, one, you must license the software on exactly the same terms you got it. And two, you must make the source code available. We'll talk about that more in a bit. Uh, but you'll notice that First of all, that's a condition uh, that is conditioned on distribution for most licenses, including GPL. And, um, uh, and there's a whole class of licenses that has this requirement. And now they would include GPL, LGPL, and the so-called weak copyleft licenses like Eclipse and Mozilla and um, CPL and CPL and so forth. Uh, so, copyleft obligation, uh, which means that if you have the software and you distribute it, even if you modify it, you must make the version, the, the source code for the version that you distributed available to all recipients of any binary. So source code licensing, as I said, for copyleft in particular, you usually must relicense the code on exactly the same terms. You may have heard people refer to open source licenses as quote unquote viral. That's not really the right word to describe them, but um, it does convey the notion that the license conditions run with the code no matter how far downstream they go. Um, 
particularly GPL and LGPL, do not allow licensing on any other terms. Um, next, uh, source code delivery. As I mentioned, part of the copyleft <coughs> obligations for a license like GPL, LGPL, or one of the weak copyleft licenses is that you must make the source code available for any binaries that you distribute. Um, GPL and to some degree L LGPL also require that you deliver not only source code but build and instruct uh, build and installation instructions for the source code so that the binaries can be created. Now, down here are some of the requirements that are less common. Some licenses require you to notice changes that you make to the software in various ways. Some require you to indemnify the original uh, provider of the software for any uh, claims that arise from your exercise of the license. And a lot of the licenses have what I would call is like a reservation of rights about trademarks. So it says you can't use the name of the licensor um, in connection with your use of the software. And uh, I, this, to my way of thinking, is not generally necessary because you're not Grant, granted any trademark right anyway. So um, these are the most common open source license obligations. Okay, how to comply. Uh, so first let's talk about um, uh, the, the notice requirements. Um, for most of the licenses, you must put the notices in your product distribution. So if you have software on a disk, your notices have to be on the disk. If you are distributing the software by a download, the notices should probably be in the download package. That is fairly straightforward if you have a, something like an operating system or you have an application software. But when you get into embedded systems, like software in a pointer, you, you really have to think hard about how you're going to deliver copyright and licensing and attribution, whatever notices, in connection with this device. Uh, particularly because when people are in the embedded space, they're often operating on razor thin margins. So while it may make a lot of sense to a lawyer to say, yeah, just put a disk in that package. You know, it may be very expensive to do that, and it also just may make it a lot more difficult to distribute the product. So the, the strategy of how you do your notices is very important. Um, a lot of my clients say to me, well, I've got a great idea. I'm going to distribute this, and I'm just going to give my customers a link where they can go and look on the web to find my notices. And that's sounds like a really great strategy and very practical, but unfortunately, it is not compliant with most open source licenses. The reason for that, by the way, is that most of the licenses were written before the web, and so they are written with the assumption that not everybody has web access. So they would, would not allow you to put licenses on the web because the, uh, I'm sorry, license notices, because the notices are supposed to be accessible to any recipient. Some of the more recent um, open source licenses have gotten a lot more sophisticated about delivery of notices, but the most common ones in use, actually, um, it can be very challenging to uh, comply with them. Um, now, remember I talked about copyleft. Um, if you have a copyleft license like GPL, then you have a couple of choices. You can deliver the source code with the product, or you can deliver it with an offer to provide the source code later. And by the way, all of the copyleft licenses more or less would allow you to do this. GPL makes this very explicit. Um, so the best practice usually is to deliver source code. And the reason I say that twofold, first, if you deliver source code, for the most part, your license notices are going to be baked into the source code. So that means you don't have to go and create a lot of notice files, which is really quite time consuming to do. The second reason why it's a good idea to do it is that let's say that you take the strategy of 
Well, GPL says I can deliver a binary, and then if someone asks me for the source code, I will provide it to them, and that sounds great, and you deliver the binary, but what actually happens in the real world, in real companies, the way they operate, is that nobody ever gets the source code distribution together. So they've got the binaries out there in the world, someone asks for the source code, and they do not have it ready to deliver. And they don't have build instructions ready, and they don't have installation instructions ready. And when that happens, and someone asks for it and you don't give it to them, that's when you start getting enforcement action. So I say delivery of source code is a good idea because it means you're less likely to get into trouble down the road. But I do understand at the same time that it can be, uh, it can be difficult and expensive to do that. So that's part of the strategy about how you can buy. Um, let's see. Uh, I mentioned that online delivery of notices is not sufficient. It sometimes can be if you're actually distributing a product that requires internet access, but that would be more of an ad hoc uh, decision that you would make. And by the way, a lot of clients also ask me, what about relying on third-party notices? In other words, I didn't modify this software. I just got it from this place over here. The source code is available in this place over here. Why do I have to make it available? Why do I have to put notices on? Well, the fact is that if you're exercising the license, you have the obligation to make source code available and put the notices on because those are the conditions of the license. So relying on third parties usually doesn't work. Um, as I said, um, LGPL and GPL allow you to make an offer for source materials but not actually deliver it with the binary. However, it's the best practice to do. Okay. Um, if you are using code that is under copyleft licenses, you also sometimes have to adjust your proprietary licensing. So what I am assuming here is that you're taking some code that is under a copyleft license and you're integrating it somehow with other proprietary code. Now there are limits on how you can do this. When it comes to GPL, it can be a very, very complicated discussion. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this in the presentation today, although I'm happy to discuss it offline with anyone who has questions. But the point is that there are ways to put copyleft code and proprietary code together in product distribution. But if you do this, you sometimes have to adjust your uh, end user license or your customer agreement. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is that licenses like GPL and LGPL do not allow relicensing on, on proprietary terms. In other words, you have your proprietary piece, you have your GPL piece, and or I should say LGPL, probably a better example in this case. And when you deliver the product to your customers, you license this piece on proprietary terms and this piece on LGPL terms. You cannot say to your customer, the whole thing is under my proprietary license. That doesn't work. So you have to adjust your end user license or your customer agreement, whatever you're using downstream, so that it makes a carve out for those, for the copyleft licenses whose terms have to be slowed down to your recipients. Um, the weak copyleft licenses like Mozilla and Eclipse actually allow you to do a bifurcated approach where you can license the whole thing under your end user license terms as long as you make the source code available for uh, under the copyleft terms. So that's a little bit more forgiving approach and a little bit more workable. But uh, rather famously, GPL and LGPL don't work with that way at all, and they're the most common licenses in use, so you need to be careful about that. Okay, so what are the key challenges? And you probably could figure this out from what I've said so far, but just to hit the nail on the head, um, if you want to be compliant with open source licenses, you basically have to do the following things. First, and very importantly, you have to know what open source licenses you're using. And, um, and by the way, companies like Nextfee and other provenance companies, uh, they do a lot of consulting to help people know what open source they're using. So what happens in the real world is engineers develop code bases and 
there is not a system in place to keep track of what code came from where and what licensing terms cover it. And the way that I like to explain this is that if you take away open source and you just think about proprietary software, there is a business process in organizations that makes you know at some level what license terms you're agreeing to. And that business process is the requirement to uh, give the licensor a check right, for a license fee. In an organization, if you've got to deliver money, there, there is process. So you, you get a proprietary license, you have to go through purchasing, you've got to go through the legal department, etc. There are, there are procedures, business processes in place. For open source, there are no business processes in place as a baseline, and so a lot of companies spend a lot of time trying to put compliance processes in place. And the reason that they don't exist sort of in the uh, natural environment of the organization is that you don't have to pay for the licenses. So first you've got to know what you're using. And if anybody uh, here has been part of a compliance or audit uh, process, you'll know that that can be extremely challenging. Then you have to figure out, you have to get your notices together. As I said, if you're delivering source code, that's easier. If you're delivering binary, it's actually quite an administrative task. You get your notices together. And then you figure out how you're going to deliver your notices. You figure out how you're going to deliver build and installation instructions if you're using GPL or LGPL software. And also, you have to ensure that your source code that you're going to deliver if someone asks is right for the binary build that you're delivering. So those are the key challenges for uh, complying with open source licenses. And I think we're on, we're on to Michael's part now. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, what I was planning to talk about was sort of compliance automation. So um, what we mean by that is, to a certain extent, um, skipping over how you get the information about what's in your open source. That's something we do day to day, so we don't ever really skip it over. But in our practice, what we find a lot of times is people start accumulating information about the open source they have, and then they get stuck with how do I manage that information, how do I keep track of it in some, in some useful way for both business people and legal people and the developers. Um, and so you've kind of done all this work to figure out what's in your code, and then the next question is what do I do next? So it is, it is a requirement that somehow you've gotten what we would call a baseline. You've got a product of some sort, you have some basic idea of what's in it, that could have been your own analysis. You could have paid someone like NextB. You could have bought tools to do it. There's all kinds of ways to get there. And it's also critical to remember that it's going to be extremely variable in terms of the depth of information. So a classic example, and this is debated all the time in our circles, um, there's a, a very uh, famous um, package that comes with Linux called BusyBox. It's been the subject of many of the lawsuits, uh, including many successful ones. There was kind of a mass lawsuit of about 12 companies um, that most of most the cases they want. Um, it's a set of simplified utilities for Linux, so it's, it's very useful to use. Um, there are hundreds of files in that package. Um, they have different copyright holders. They have um, you know, different levels of detail in all those hundreds of files. But the overall package is under GPL 2.0. There's no question about that. Um, so a question some people say, well, I want to know what's in every single file. And the SPDX group that, that Heather referenced, I'll talk about a little more. There's many people who think we need to have every level of detail. And another point of view is we know what the license is. There's no dispute about that. There's lawsuits. People aren't arguing about the underlying components. They're saying it's almost 99% of the time you use the whole package. It has a single license. What I really want to do there is just get the full set of, of authors that I give attribution to and treat it as one thing, not as hundreds of files. There's no right answer, but there's a lot of trade-offs in that. So part of your baseline is figuring that out and, and getting some basic information. And a key part to think about from the beginning that we find people aren't quite as aware of is distinguishing between what's in your product. We call that deployed, to use a, a general purpose term. But that means whatever is in your product as the customer uses it, whether you ship it, download it, whatever the case may be, um, versus what's in your development environment. So Typically, a, a subset of what you, your developers actually work with is in your product, maybe 50%, maybe less. And it's very important to just have a, some basic concepts about that. It can get very, very complex to figure that out in detail, but you want to have that at a very high level 
as a, as a distinguishing point as you go through this, through this process. So what we're going to talk about here is sort of some practical ideas and, and actual um, examples of how you can automate the compliance. And one of the challenges here uh, is, is engaging the engineering team. So most of the audience here, I presume, is from a legal or a business background. But, um, and lots of systems are out there today that are probably more oriented toward the legal and business view of compliance than the engineering team. On the engineering side, you need something that's basically close to the code. The engineers are not experts on licensing. You may want to educate them, or you may want to have some forum that they pass the information through you, but they're the ones who are close to the code. They see the code every day. They, they know what's in their package from a technical point of view. They may not know what the licensing implications are, but they know what's in there technically. So the farther away you get from the code base, the harder it is to maintain the data. So our philosophy is, is that you really want to you want to go through a process, and this is what I'm going to detail, you get your baseline information at whatever level of detail makes sense for you. You want to feed it back into the engineering system. And, and it's, you know, it's not that you're just saying, okay, I, I do that once, I put it in the engineering database, everything's done. There's got to be an ongoing audit process. But in our daily work, what we find is that people are constantly reanalyzing code. In other words, they're not auditing, they're not sampling to see if the data is correct. They're looking at everything over and over again because they don't have a process to say, here's my baseline, here's how it's supposed to be maintained. Then I go back and audit, just like in a financial scenario, you sample, you know, you have 1,000 invoices, you sample 10 invoices. If they all look good, you may just pass on and look at them again in a year. If uh, two out of the 10 are problematic, then you probably sample another 10 and so on. So the auditing term is, is important there. So we're, we're trying to think about this in a, in a repeatable way, in a way that you move forward. Um, to do this time after time. So one idea that we, we think is a good one is what we call a highest common requirement. When you look at open source licenses, they get to be very complex. We have a, a product we call the license library, which you can use online for free. And we have about 30 different tags, 30 different ways to identify specific clauses that exist in various licenses. And they're written differently. And it takes a while to sort that out. But once you sorted it out, a policy is going to be much easier to implement if you, if you work with some, some simple standards. So Heather brought it up earlier uh, in terms of the non-endorsement trademark. Um, there's a series of licenses called attribution licenses, permissive licenses, whatever. Uh, the most common ones are the MIT license and its variants, X11 and several others, and the BSC licenses. And the most common BSC license is called BSC modified or BSC new, depending on your background. The difference between an MIT and a BSD, not speaking legally, but still practically, is that the BSD has a no endorsement clause, which is basically saying you can't use my name or the name of my project or whatever and, and say that we endorse you. Well, that's similar to a trademark thing. And basically, I don't know of any company that would want to do that anyway. I mean, your normal policies would be that you would not use somebody else's name as an endorsement without their permission, right? It's just kind of general commercial practice. So practically speaking, you can treat those as the same. In other words, you can say, I don't, on the MIT license, I don't have to sign up to do no endorsement, but if you have a no misuse of trademark policy, it's, you don't have to distinguish now between the obligations for those two licenses. That's an example sort of a, you know, maybe you overdo it for a few licenses, but it simplifies your life in terms of the variety of licenses out there. So that's what we mean by the highest common requirement. Same sort of thing for displaying attribution text or documenting the attribution text. This is, again, typically the license notices. Sometimes a, a license tells you, say this thing in your product, right? Use this exact terminology uh, when you display it. Again, it, it may be easier to over-attribute, to just standardize. We're always going to acknowledge who, who um, provided the, the code, even if I'm not required to. And there's an interesting conundrum that we often run into with what it's very what we call public domain licenses. Typically, license says it's free, do whatever you want. If you don't maintain the notice that, someone, that the author said that, how do you know it's public domain? In other words, you have to have some record of who said it was OK to use. So it's generally better, again, to sort of set the bar a little higher than the minimum of what you need to do, because then you, know, you can standardize it across, across the packages. Um, in source code, obviously, you would want to be a little uh, more, more uh, careful about that. Um, but there may be many cases when it's not such a big deal for you to, to give out the source code. Um, so 
Again, it's just trying to simplify, instead of trying to you know, read each license and understand it, sort of create buckets, have someone from a legal from a business perspective agree these are the major buckets, but not try to deal with exactly the specific requirements of each license differently. Um, another good one is, is change documentation. So again, um, some of the, the most important licenses like GPL and LGPL require you to track your changes. Some licenses just say you have to, to um, tell people you changed them, you don't have to say what they are. Sometimes they want you to change the name of files based on it. Again, you can come back and look at this and a standard way of tracking change documentation in the code base is a good practice no matter what. It's not something a lot of developers may want to do, but it's absolutely a good practice. There is no downside to doing it this way, and that way it's, it's always available. And within all this, though, regardless of this, just always keep whatever original information you have. Whatever else you add to the code base, always keep, keep the originals. Um, so what we look at is, is kind of a simple approach because, you know, how can we get this in, in offer a solution so people can do this in a way that's independent of specific tools, specific languages, um, and, and generally accessible to engineers. Um, in the in the SPDX project, the standards project, they have what's called an RDF format, it's kind of like XML, and they have a, a tag value format, you know, label data, label data. And there's several members of the team who, who will frequently state that real engineers don't use XML. I mean, there's there's Keeping it really simple, text files, there's no source code system that cannot handle additional text files. There's, it's just, there's, there's no problem with that. Now, there are specialized solutions in, in certain development environments, particularly in Java. There are commercial tools. There are open source tools for certain languages that do certain things that already do this for you. But in, in general, we find, particularly in the embedded space, that that's not actually the case. They're not, they're not there. Um, so what you're basically trying to do is, is you know, out of your baseline audit, get this license data, get it down at a practical level in your code base so that you can output data for two basic purposes. Well, one basic purpose, which is whatever attribution, text, or documentation you're supposed to provide, uh, including things like change logs, and whatever source code you may be obliged to redistribute. The software package data exchange, I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute, is a new specification for how you transmit this metadata. Um, but it may be a lot more than you want to put in each file. I mean, it's, it's an output format so that company A and company B can exchange information, but um, it's not necessarily something that you would want to have an engineer try and edit. And another thing that we, in, in our thinking, is, is that you want to be prepared to import into enterprise systems. Most people don't have those yet, but ultimately you're going to need an enterprise system to capture the product data, the components in your, in your product. So you want a format where you can upload it into an enterprise system, meaning a system where you can share data about all your products. You might have products with very different technologies. You know, you might have acquired companies, various things. Uh, in the legal and business sense, you want to see the big picture across the team. On uh, a team-by-team -team basis, you want to give them something they can use individually. So part of, part of the purpose of describing this is, 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 I guess, kind of from a legal perspective, say there are solutions out there. The engineers may not be excited about this. Um, but there are practical ways to do it. You may have to, you know, move, uh, put a little pressure on, but it's, it's, it's not impossible. It's, it's not that hard. So software package data exchange, very quickly, is a uh, new format. It's in version one. As Heather mentioned, uh, my colleague Philippe and I got to help get this thing started. It's a working group of the Linux Foundation, and it's evolving pretty rapidly. It is a specification, so it, it's basically a very detailed specification to be very, very precise, and one of the challenges for people complying with it or adopting it is what level of detail. Again, you want to, you tell somebody, I use BusyBox in my product, you want to give them the record that shows all hundreds of files or a single record that says, I use BusyBox, I haven't modified it, it's standard, here's the license. Probably the latter in most business contexts. Um, if you want to get involved, there's, there's a business team, a legal team. Um, the, the legal team has come up with a a master list of the most common licenses and license terms that have been um, adopted by OSI, who you know, uh, define the original open source licenses. The Debian and uh, Fedora groups and so on are starting to harmonize. So it's a very simple thing, but one of the things is just having a standard name for a license. When I say GPL V2, that's a specific name. So just saying GPL, you don't know, you don't know quite what people mean. So that's been, it's a small piece to get started, but it's, it's, it's picking up steam. Can I, can yeah. I interject one thing? Yeah. Um, right now, uh, 
I just wanted to point out that without a standard format to do this, uh, there is an incredible amount of time burnt up on it, right? So what will typically happen, for instance, is a company is distributing a product, customer says, please tell us what open source is in this product as part of their diligence, and then the parties start exchanging documents in forms that are not standardized, don't have the right information, have stuff like GPL with no version number and so forth. And it is an administrative nightmare, basically. And so this is a way to try to, you know, hugely streamline this product, this process, which is, I think, really long overdue. It is long overdue, and, it, and it, there is no hope without a, without a, a standard way to communicate. So, so that you know, the basics are there. There will be some tools, um, but it, yeah, it, it, it's amazing how much work there is to do to get something started. But, but it, it is there today. We, Kind of an aside yeah. question. What was the thinking behind trademarking the name? <laughs> <laughs> That's a long story. I'll be glad to tell you later. But um, I, I listened to it. But we have a very active legal track. Great mind. Um, it had mostly to do with opinions from Karen Copenhaver from the Linux Foundation, uh, Esteban Rocket from Motorola, who was like the chair of the legal committee, and so on. Okay. Um, and I imagine there would be a story. That's there is a story. I can tell you. But, but a, a very interesting thing. And so just because we, I think we have a primarily legal audience. When we started out, there was also a lot of discussion about what would be the license for data conveyed in this format. Um, this is a very compliant heavy group. I think sometimes. It's a <laughs> and so great, great legal minds thought about this, and they said, We're, "Well, we, we want it to be under the PDDL." I can't remember the name of that one, but it's a very long license, 20 pages. Public, it's public domain. Dead documentation, li data license? Data license. Yes, yeah. I think that's it. It um, has had some good people working on it. It's intended to encompass all sorts of European, no offense, but European concerns, you know, European rules about <laughs> data and moral rights and whatever. It, we started out with that, and basically, you know, the, the answer from the open source community was no way. We're not even going to talk about it. So now you can go out and see the proposed license, um, and it's basically a, a simplified um, um, creative contribution license with a special disclaimer, a single paragraph disclaimer. So we had good feedback. We changed course. Um, it was way overkill. Um, but I'll, I can talk about that a little later. But that's you know that, that's the, the legal group runs that, and the Linux Foundation um, has a very very active legal committee, and, and, and there's kind of um, so basically what this approach is about is you create text files, we call them component metadata. You create text files in some way that they're easily identifiable and you put them in the code base. So this is just a very simple example of information you might put in there. And um, there are things here, uh, you know, certain flags you might want to set, for instance, you might want to, this is just an example, but you know, you can put other things in this file that are related to your automation process, but the idea is just keep it really simple. Um, so we have, a, we will give you an example from Android, and we ourselves use a slightly different approach. Um, XML is a possibility, but if you're most times with developers, you just want something very simple. So it's basically a set of text files, and then the programs are processed that are more or less script programs that can read through these things and create information. And it might be as simple as going through your code base and producing a disclosure list that your, your customer asked you for. So maybe you're early on in some negotiation about a product, some shared product or something. They want a disclosure list. You can easily read through this and get a spreadsheet, and it just lists them all. I mean, it's also something you do with SPDX. But at a very simple level, you want to be able to pull that from the code base. Because any data that's not in the code base gets even out of date even quicker. Right? If it's not there, where it's visible. So the point, again, is some legal involvement has to be in there just saying that this is the license and so on. Um, this is not interpreting the obligations. It's just giving you, you data. Um, but if you get it right in the beginning and you audit it, you've got a pretty good shot at keeping that up to date. And again, this is simple. You don't have to buy somebody a new product. You don't change your source code control system. You don't change your build system. Nothing has to change to implement something like this in any, in any programming environment. So um, on the automation side, you basically have programs to read this, and you create the simplest level. You create two things. One is an actual attribution text file, 
a little harder than you might think because you have to sort of think about how you want to organize it, um, you know, what sort of levels of detail. But if you have the data in simple text files, you can generate an attribution text. And we do this for our customers all the time. Um, you know, the, there's, no, there's no mandated style for your whole product. You have some freedom about how to do it. And in the attribution area, effort counts for 99.9%. .9%. You know, if you make a mistake in the attribution file, but you've got most of it, I can't imagine any open source project that's going to come after you. The other simple deliverable is a redistribution package list. Basically, at the very least, a list of the components that have to be redistributed. That doesn't solve your problem, but it's a starting point, and you want to always keep your eye on that. If you haven't focused on which, which elements of your development code are deployed or not, you may need to come back and do some, some editing, but at least you've got something to start with that's not completely manual. And usually, this text file can come out in a format that is you know, right, ready to go. You can put it in a manual. You can put it in a GUI page. Um, we usually produce them in kind of a you know, very, very simple HTML format. So if you go into a browser like Mozilla, they have a pretty good approach. You go in an Android device or a, a nice, uh, an Apple device, you'll have you know, some, some setting that says system slash something slash something slash legal, and you'll get this very long document. And that's, you know, that's, those are generally generated. This is a trickier part. Um, that you probably over time want to be more sophisticated with, but if you aren't already tracking, you know, on an ongoing basis for every release, what are the redistributable components, uh, and, and if developers aren't aware of those pieces, then, then you can have some pretty big problems down the line. The more sophisticated approach is essentially taking your source code system, your not build system, and have it recognize these files. So there's lots of ways to do this, but you can you know, build logic when you build your product to look at data in here and, and use it, for instance, to set, you know, to assemble the files, you know, the subset files you need for those things that are in your end product. You can collect it in that, you know, it's pretty easy to create a text file right there. You can even, you know, kind of insert the, the HTML file or whatever right into your code tree. It can all be pretty easily automated. Um, on the source code side, uh, typically what you can do once you have a list is you can then collect the source code, whether you distribute it with the product or you're going to put it somewhere ready for when someone picks you up on your offer. Um, the key point there is to have it ready. If someone comes a year later, with GPL you basically have to keep the source code for three years. If, if someone comes a year after you worked on the code, trying to comply with that could be almost hopeless uh, and very painful. You may just beg for mercy because, you know, people develop, you know, you may not be able to recreate the environment. Um, and then, you know, just create an archive file of, of, of that code. You can either distribute it or you can hold on to it, post it somewhere. Some companies do it publicly. Um, so very quickly, just an example of how it works. Android does this today. Now, not all parts of this are visible publicly, um, but we have done a lot of Android audits, and they've already got a, a pretty good approach. It's pretty heterogeneous. It's used to create the attribution text, and it's used to create the source code packages. Now, not every Android, Android, uh, not every customer buys Android product does it this way. For instance, I'll give you some links to how Motorola does it, and they do it this way. Uh, Samsung seems to do some different things, but basically, it, it's embedded today in the whole system. So, the basic approach is there's something called module license. So, these are basically empty files where module underscore license underscore some name refers to a license. And if it's a standard license, Apache 2.0, GPL 2.0, whatever, it's fairly easy. Um, if not, there's more work. But this is just, again, you'll just, you'll just see right in the code tree, and any developer can see this file, and it just has you know, nothing in it, but it has that name. And it's a pretty good clue to start with. <laughs> then the notice files help you with other information. So just because the license is Apache 2.0, it could be from the Apache Foundation. I don't know, lots of cases it is, but it could be for someone else. So for your attribution, you need to know who the author is. And there may be other, other information. So in the patching the notice file, there may be other information. Um, so there's these notice files. Um, and what we see in Android today, meaning Jelly Bean, is it's a mixture of things that they've been brought forward from projects that they use and a lot created by the team. And you'll also notice they still keep all the original notices. So they don't, you know, this is, this is a level of sort of standardization on top of whatever a project might provide. And that's a key point here is to have a standard approach across all the code. So open source, you know, make the system work, you have to have a consistent uh, set of data. Um, so there are tools built in. Um, we
we've got analysis, and I'll have a, a URL for you if you want to go look at it more detail. Uh, but it does the attribution notice creation, and it does create source code packages. And so this is integrated into the build system, and we have details about what files do that and so on, but it's all there today. Um, and the, they've been pretty clever about making sure that they're only <coughs> giving you attribution and source code for elements that are in a product. And that's very, very important in the Android world because there's lots of pieces of proprietary software, too, that are, are proprietary to the, to the chip provider or something, right? So you really have to be focused on what's exactly in your tablet or your phone or your remote or whatever it is. You can't just um, start distributing code, for instance, for things that aren't in your, your product. Um, so, you know, you can go, uh, you know, this as well. This is, you know, most Android phones. I had a lovely Nexus 7 that got stolen in Belgium, but I looked at this myself. You can check it out. Motorola Mobility, a uh, company we work with, and they take a very affirmative approach, and they actually publish the packages. So they use this internal system, and you can go out to this website, and they post the code for each of their Android phones pretty pretty quickly. So for instance, I just went out and pulled some things recently, and it was the, the new Razer HD, which is only, I don't know, like a month old or something like that. Oh, I'm OK. OK. So, um, the, set, the other one, go just go quickly, is we've got something a little different of our own um, that we're offering. This is not Android specific, just more general purpose. We call it uh, our product stage code. We call it the about system. And we've come up with, I think, maybe a little more um, detailed approach. These are examples of some of the fields. And we have a specification that, that's online. But our intent is to allow this to be a fairly general purpose system. And again, a big part of this is having sort of a consistent level of information about all your open source, regardless of where it came from. So it may be redundant for some packages that are really well structured and the, and the supplier gives you to you, but lots of them don't. Um, so you use the component metadata. The tools we have, you can create a spreadsheet very quickly. You can create a text file. You can create a package list. This is what we would call the basic, the basic approach uh, today. Um, and what we're uh, bringing forward is we've just started a new site where we're going to start sponsoring uh, a way for people to share this kind of information. Um, we tried to get this going on SPDX dot, on the SPDX org, and the organization didn't quite work out. Uh, so we just decided to, to go ahead and do it on our own. So what you can find there today um, is a pretty detailed white paper about the Android system and a white paper about our system. Um, and over time, we're going to we're pretty quickly going to add some information. I mean, in certain environments, for instance, you, all your products are in Java, and you use the Apache Maven system, there's a whole different way of doing things. And that's really great if everything you do is Java. But that's not the case for most people. And also, if you're in a company that uses Java and other things, that may not be a comprehensive solution. So this is a new community site, no, not a commercial site. Um, we'll post a project with our, it has a spec now, we'll post a project with our tools. And the idea is to just provide pretty good solutions. So again, there'll be commercial solutions that are more sophisticated for certain combinations of development tools that you may already have or purchase. That's great. But for a lot of people, you know, that kind of ideal solution is the enemy of a decent solution. And it becomes kind of like a reason to not get started because it's too hard, right? I've got to get this piece in place. I've got to get this piece. How many developers do I license for? Whatever. We, we need to move beyond that. So in, in summary, what we're we're, we're saying is that you know you do have to have a baseline, and of course we're happy to do those for you. But I mean somehow you've got to get a baseline. Some people want to go down to the lowest level of detail, some don't. And what you can do once you have that is you can create these files. Again, they can be created automatically. It's not very difficult. And just basically get the engineers used to making basic updates to those files during the process. Um, at very point in the process or on a release, what you want to do is generate kind of a summary. It could be as simple as a spreadsheet from those files and audit that result so you can audit the code. Um, so you want to have some checkpoint about any of the changes, and then you know you can generate your deliverables and, and regenerate. So the idea is to get something very basic in place. Uh, it does need to be based on your policies and some baseline analysis, but you can use a pretty simple use as many fields as, as they have a lot of optional fields. It certainly would work for the license um, and attribution of your distribution case and other things you could do. Um, 
in those cases, uh, you, you know, putting it into your build system, totally automating it, that, that is real work. Uh, but you can start simple, and over time, you know, the, the value of that higher degree of automation depends on, on your environment, on your developers, and so on. But our experience with developers is they kind of like that approach more, too. So um, you could sort of think about, I want to do this piece, I want to do a little more, I want to get a little more sophisticated, it doesn't have to do it all at once. What you got to do is just get the basic data in a way that's accessible in the engineering environment, and then can be shared with the legal and business people who need to see it. That's the basic idea. So, um, and, and the repeat part's important too. It's, you know, if you have new products coming out, you're, you're stuck with having to, to do this again and again. What you want to have is that the incremental effort to do a new release of a product you already understand pretty well should be in the you know, 10 to 20% range, not in the 60 to 70% range, which is often the case for that. So I think that, that's, up, yeah, there we go. We have a couple of questions online. Yeah, we have some questions online which I answered because I okay. don't know that the entire group would be interested. But um, does anyone in the room have questions? Does it make sense? Or? <laughs> no, not? Done. What does an app developer do? I mean, does, it, does an app that you might download, does it have to have a, yep. let's say it's got you mean like a mobile, a mobile app? A smartphone app or something? Yeah. Yeah, there's no, there's no exemption for them. There, there are real issues with using some open source code in apps because the terms of licenses like DTL and LCL are arguably inconsistent with app store terms. It's, it's, a, it's a question that there's some debate about. But, and, it's generally known that there's a lot of GPL code and LGPL code in apps, but there probably shouldn't be. So it can be an issue with apps more because of the way the app store runs than anything else. It's because the, the uh, developer of the app isn't actually distributing it, and there aren't good mechanisms to say ask for source code and get it. So. Um, Yes, it does apply to apps, but there are particular problems with using um, some kinds of open source code in apps. And by the way, um, you, no matter how you feel about the question, if an open source author says that, the, that putting open source code in an app is an infringement and sends a takedown notice to Apple, they'll just take it down. And that will be the end of the story. And you really don't get to the merit of it, <laughs> right? Because if it's out of the store, it's out of the store. So they uh, want to deal with you those. need to be very cautious about using um, copy list code. I would guess that 99% of the app developers that might use this don't know about it. Probably not. Probably not. And yeah, also web developers. Right. One of the other things we're seeing, we were interested in, so we were interested in is, um, traditionally, the idea was you only worried about the copyright licenses if you ship the product or you ship it. Um, there's a surprising number of, of web-type applications written languages like JavaScript that are now coming out under LGPL or GPL. And traditionally, that wasn't the case. It was almost always under first slide, so people kind of their radar is low on that. And that could have a pretty pernicious effect. Um, I don't think there's really a clear understanding of what all the rules mean in that case. but. You know, and, and some of these are three cases where developers, oh, I like that license. It just, you know, all the time we talk to developers, why didn't you choose that license? Oh, well, that's what everybody talked about. So, you know, maybe you can get them to change the license, but there's more in the general web world now <coughs> in dealing with copy left than, than, say, three or four years ago. To work on. Are a bunch of those takedown notices being sent to the app store? You know, not as many as you might expect, but I know that they have taken things down. There, yeah. Yeah, there, there yeah. were a handful. Sort of one short burst, and then see some. Been quiet. Some people think that the app store terms are inherently conflicting with GPL. Other people take a, a, a you know, sort of more lenient view. But there, there have been takedown requests, and and Apple won't say anything about it. Of course, right? Why would you expect them to? <laughs> so uh, they just take it down. And, and then it's so complicated that people just go other directions. Yeah, you've lost your spot in the store. But I think, I think 
there was a study done about open source code, GPL code in apps, and you know, it's just all over the place, right? It just doesn't end up in enforcement. But this would be much more interesting when you go beyond consumer apps to you know, businesses creating apps for their customers, right? Maybe if they put it for their employees, you don't have the same set of issues, but it's becoming much more common. You know, it's not just the general public, whatever, music app or something, it's some specific subset of business functionality now I'm distributing that to customers. Then it's going to, you know, beside the app store, because you might even have a private, I think, didn't just Google announce they're going to have private stores? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It is, so you're going to have a way you can transmit apps for Android devices through private channels. But then you know you still have to look at that. And then those apps are likely to be more maybe more sophisticated in some cases. So you can look at apps and so there's there's some things to watch out for here. Um, the key message I, I think Kevin and I agree on is that the first most important thing is to get started and do the basics because those are not so hard. The really sophisticated stuff may be hard. But that's not where people are getting caught. They're getting in real yeah, trouble. They're, they're, they're getting, getting caught for really basic. Right. They're not trying, <laughs> no, or no. or not trying and then stonewall. Right. That was like the physical link just was not trying and then you do something wrong. But the basic compliance, you can define a level at a risk management level that may not have every bit of minutia about every subcomponent of a of a sort of source project, but you'll get the substantial things. And that's your risk. Right. Your risk is with well known components that Someone who's interested in having you comply can find. Um, if you have a 10 line snippet of code, one place in code that you don't ship the binary, no one's going to find that. That's how you should do the right thing, but the risk is so much lower. But it's these bigger pieces, and everybody's using them, right? It's every kind of application. I might add one other thing. I, I'm Heather's uh, associate who does a lot of this. I might add one other thing about the apps, which is that the the number of pieces of code involved tend to be uh, much smaller. So even if this has all seemed sort of overwhelming, uh, it's worth dealing with because they might, the, the apps that we see here tend to have two, three, four pieces of open source code in them, as opposed to if you're shipping an Android phone, uh, you know, that's hundreds, right? And that is a huge task to take on. But in fact, you know, doing it for an app that, that you or your company might ship, uh, or that some of your clients might ship, it's often actually, uh, it shouldn't be that intimidating. It's something that can be a pretty manageable thing to understand. All right, well, we want to be respectful of everyone's time, although we will be around to answer some questions. I want to thank Michael very much for coming down and, uh, and doing the presentation with me. And I'd like to thank all of you and the people on the webinar for, um, for participating. We will have the slides available and uh, uh, there's going to be a recording of the webinar available if you're interested. So thank you everyone very much for coming.